There is no way to avoid the mess. The mess you make of your life, of your body, of your sanity, by giving everything you have to pleasing people you will never know. Hello and welcome back. I'm Ren, and today I'm going to recreate the darkest dish from the menu. A dish that represents the underlying futility in all things we do. This dish features one of the best ingredients in the world, bone marrow, which I'll start by purifying in a salt bath. If you ever had bone marrow that tasted gamey and metallic, it's because it wasn't properly cleaned. So we're going to run it under water until the water becomes clear, and then add more salt than it would seem to need. Overnight this will draw out the impurities, leaving us with trunks of pure beefy butter. If you're wondering why I have so many bones here, it's because I thought that if I have to cook one, I might as well make a feast out of it. The next day we're going to pat it dry before laying it on a baking tray. After sprinkling a copious amount of salt, we're going to leave it out to dry while preparing the other ingredients. The first one being rutabaga if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Rutabaga rutabaga. This root vegetable is healthy and delicious and tastes like a combination of fennel and potato. If you ever get bored of potatoes, which I never will, you could use rutabaga. According to the film, we're supposed to pressure cook this to evoke the sense of pressure we feel when crushed by the weight of impossible expectations. But a slow chronic simmer should be much worse, or much better, depending on what you're into. Cook it slowly and painfully until tender. To make the sauce, I'm using beef bones, which I'm going to sentence to a 40 minute baking at an infernal 500 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't use a timer though, I just checked until it was ready. Bakery boo and then take it out. The bones are now perfect for making soup, but for this recipe I'll only need the fond at the bottom of the pan. The smell of roasted bones is heavenly. I like to use Pinot Noir or Burgundy for French sauces. This one's from Ontario, Canada, which I've never tried before. We're using the wine to deglaze the pan and infuse the wine with all the beef drippings. Making French food while having wine is the ultimate indulgence. For a Canadian wine, this one was surprisingly good. Once the alcohol is cooked away, we can add the beef stock, and that's all you need to make beef jus, the simple perfect sauce made of beef and wine to pair with beef and wine. Reduce it by half before passing it through a sieve. I think they're using morel mushrooms in the movie. These are silly expensive and cost me more than the filet mignon I'm about to cook. Let them sit in the water to clean themselves out. A lot of dirt tends to get trapped inside because they've got all these holes and stuff. Along with those I have some mythical black trumpet mushrooms. I don't know if they're actually mythical, but I've never seen them in my life. These are also so expensive it feels like getting robbed. It seems to me that in fine dining, we're always cooking things separately, mainly for the sake of presentation. It can be annoying when we're cooking at home and we just want to get good simple food on the table, but doing so does allow us to enjoy each element separately before finding out how they all come together. After burning the edges of pearl onions, we're going to start cooking the mushrooms. Into the hot pan we're adding some garlic, salt, a few sprigs of thyme, and a conservative knob of butter because we're not degenerates. As the mushrooms cook, we can observe their colors darken to pure black. A deathly color for a deathly dish. Nice. We're going to sprinkle some pepper and salt on the now room temperature filet mignon. Give it a nice rub all around before dropping it into a smoking hot pan. In the movie, they probably cooked it sous vide, but I think sous vide sucks the soul out of cooking, so I'm going to show you how to achieve the same result in just a pan. We need to flip the meat every 20 seconds for it to sear properly without overcooking. We're doing this to prevent that layer of moisture from building up and boiling the meat from underneath. In the absence of water, the mired reaction takes place. After about 4 minutes of constant flipping, we get a proper crust on the outside, with a perfectly cooked rare interior. Next, we're going to deglaze the pan with butter, and cook the garlic and herbs just a little bit more, before pouring all the contents over the beef to let the flavors continue to infuse. Everything's coming together now, so it's time to bake the bone marrows at 500 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes. At this point, we've reached the most annoying part of fine dining. Preparing all those damn garnishes. I found these cookie cutters in my friend's drawer. Don't know why she has them, she hasn't been baking me cookies. And I picked the closest thing to a cylinder, which happened to be a balloon. Did the deed on the rutabaga, and trimmed the edge off. I don't know what plant those green leaves are from, so I just took a few salad leaves and cut them into circles. I'm quite glad I don't work at Hawthorne, I'd be the first casualty. Once the bone marrow is cooked, we're gonna let it rest. Don't worry about any blemishes on the bone, you can just scrape them off. They each have different cooking times, so unfortunately some got overcooked and collapsed. But don't worry, nothing is going to waste. We're gonna scoop out some of the liquefied bone marrow at the bottom of the tray. Add it to a hot pan with some butter to create a modified beurre menu. Then we're gonna pour in the beef jus from earlier. Reduce it to get the most pure and decadent beef sauce. 
Next, we're going to cut the filet mignon with a revolutionary cutting technique as shown in the film. Finally, to plate, I created a circle of greens because I don't have a green plate. Starting with a majestic segment of leg bone of cow, followed by less than perfect cubes of figuratively perfectly cooked filet mignon. Rutabaga that I torched while my iPhone went to sleep. Those damn mushrooms that were too damn expensive. Pearl onions with eyeliner, some leaves, and a generous spoonful of our glossy bone marrow sauce. Which I did not filter, but we've already established that I would be the first casualty. Finally, it's time to find out what it tastes like. The filet mignon is just pure smoky beef with a springiness that gives the dish a sort of tangibility. To access the marrow, you gotta do some weird stuff with the bone. The flavor seems to capture the essence of life. The sauce is a concentrated medley of beef bone and fat, accentuated by the subtle acidity from the wine. These combined flavors of beef are grounded by the fragrant earthiness of the rutabaga. And I'm just trying to sound pretentious here. Overall great dish, but the portion is tiny and definitely not enough. So now it's time for the real feast. I'm spreading some liquid and solid bone marrow on slices of sourdough baguette, and then baking them until irresistibly crunchy. A quick tabouleh by combining finely cut parsley, onion, tomato, and the juice of two lemons. And now before me is a true feast, as I present to you, bone marrow from almost a whole cow, extra scraps from the mess, a freshly made tabouleh, and sourdough toast, and all served with a glass of Pinot Noir. I starved myself all day for this, and this meal just completed my life. There is inspiration to be drawn from this dish, as it could be seen as a signal that we've dedicated our lives to things we aren't meant to do. Either because we're not suited for it, we're doing it the wrong way, or simply because we just don't care about it. And perhaps if only the chef could see that there is... Oh, never mind. If you want to see more dishes from the menu, then check out my breadless bread plate. I'll probably make all the dishes from the menu eventually. Thanks for tuning in. Now, bye-bye.